Good afternoon and welcome to the Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Wasserman at the 2018 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Corey Brumbergs. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce this presentation, uh, Bringing Basketball Analytics to the Women's Game. Uh, at, at the end, we'll leave about five minutes for questions. If you do have questions, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, and with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Aaron Barzilai. Hey, thanks, Corey. Okay, thanks a lot, Corey. I really appreciate that uh, introduction. I also want to say thanks to Jessica and Daryl, the entire Sloan uh, Organizing Committee, for having here to me here today, as well as Wasserman for sponsoring this session. It's a real uh, privilege to be up here presenting to you today about basketball analytics for the women's game. I've actually been to all 12 of the Sloan uh, Sports Analytics Conferences. I believe I'm one of roughly 12 people that have, apparently. Uh, it's about 100 that first year. Uh, this is the first chance I've ever had to, project, to present. So hopefully I'll do well enough, you guys will at least let me back in the building, if not uh, up here talking again next year. I also wanted to take a minute to thank all of you for being here. I think I see some uh, old friends, some folks that I've met uh, for the first time this weekend, and some folks I haven't had a chance to talk to yet. Um, I know there's a lot more glamorous people talking about a lot more glamorous topics in other rooms, so I really, really appreciate you making the choice to be here. I will say, you're free to report anything I say today, tweet it out, spread the word. We need a lot of support for her, her hoop stats, herhoopstats.com. Uh, so if you need any suggestions on what to say, I'd be happy to do that. Um, again, though, I do think, though, that's really a good summary of uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, this work is not glamorous, right? We're not reinventing basketball analytics. It doesn't need to be reinvented for the women's game. Um, you know, other talks that are going on right now, things that have been happening all weekend, whether it's about purchasing a team, creating a new stat. Um, if you can imagine a, a parallel universe Sloan conference where 99% of the attendees are female, and the WNBA is kind of the most represented professional league, uh, a talk like this wouldn't be interesting. Those kinds of talks, the AI and its impact on sports still would apply. You know, the challenges that we're really focused on, uh, it's really an execution challenge. How can we deliver women's basketball stats reliably uh, and affordably as we're trying to grow our audience? And then there's also a big component of change management. I think roughly right now, uh, analytics for the women's game might be where the NBA was in 2004 or 2005, right when uh, the Sloan Conference was just getting started, probably a gleam in uh, Daryl and Jessica's eye. And so there's a huge uh, component of spreading the word, helping people understand, right? You can't expect a basketball fan to really be concerned about the lack of availability of usage rate for the top players in women's college basketball when they've never had that stat accessible to them before, right? It's a whole chicken and egg problem. So I think that's sort of encapsulated, uh, talking about two players, Markel Fultz and uh, Kelsey Plum. How many of you have heard of Markel Fultz? Yeah, I'm not surprised most people have. How about Kelsey Plum? So I wasn't shocked that, that she'd be well represented in this room. I was trying to think ahead of time, uh, if I was to pull all 4,000 people that are here, how much you know, bigger that number would grow. I think it'd be more than two times, but I'm not 100% sure it'd be an order of magnitude greater. But uh, as, uh, as we say here on this slide, uh, you know, they really did have similar profiles in their respective games last year. Both played at Washington, coincidentally. Uh, Markel Fultz uh, was a one and done, or maybe three quarters and done, since he shut it down early last season. Uh, Kelsey Plum, of course, played all four seasons. Uh, Fultz played about 900 minutes last year, whereas Kelsey Plum, since she played the whole season, got it up to about 1,300. So if you think about it, it's kind of crazy. Kelsey Plum played more minutes last year than Markel Fultz did in his entire career for the Huskies. Um, of course, there's more to basketball than just the time you're spending on the court. It's very important, but uh, and Alan Iverson might disagree with me. But if you take a look at how much time people are spending on basketball off the court, um, and I wasn't able to talk to them individually, but I found some stats from the NCAA. They did a self-reported survey, and both on the men's and the women's side, it was about the same, roughly uh, 34 minute hours a week during the season for the men and 35 for the women. I'm sure that's essentially the same. My guess would be two players, the caliber of Fultz and Plum were over that, but nevertheless, I think we can all agree they were putting in about the same amount of time kind of crafting, uh, honing their game. So both were highly decorated. Sorry about the slides here. Markel Fultz, you know, even though he didn't play the whole season, was third team All-America. And uh, Kelsey Plum was actually the player of the year and first team uh, All-America. 
then in here in the North American Basketball Leagues, both of them were very high on their, uh, their trajectory as a uh, basketball player. Pretty much everybody in the NBA, except maybe Danny Ainge, had uh, Markel Fultz as the number one pick, and then uh, Kelsey Plum was the number one pick in the WNBA. So they were uh, very fortunate in uh, the Northwest to have a couple of great basketball players. And I think you can uh, agree, I don't think it's shocking to say that you know, Kelsey Plum was at least as important to the women's game uh, in her respective game as Markel Fultz was to the men. She probably had a bigger profile. But of course, you know, those are two different worlds and that was just kind of reinforced for me as we've been working on her hoop stats for the last uh, few months. You know, one question I asked myself was, you know, how many people are women's basketball fans? How big uh, is the market? How many people uh, really care about this missing data? And so there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Some of these I found before I decided to uh, invest my time. Uh, others I found as I was preparing for this talk. You know, one way you can think about it is how many people came to watch them play their home games. Uh, for the women, about half the people, 50%, uh, was roughly the attendance last year. And uh, Everyone's explained to me there can be a lot of gaming of NCAA attendance numbers. I'm not sure how much of that is consistent with the women and the men. I imagine there's probably some for both, but that's one way to think about it. Maybe it's 50%. I wasn't able to get the television numbers for Washington specifically, uh, but I was able to find how many people watched a Pac-12, watched a game on the Pac-12 network uh, in the last 12 months. So in total on the men's side, it was just short of two million, whereas for the women, it was about 500,000. So that suggests you know, maybe about a quarter the size of the market. And then another way to think about it, I'm not sure uh, whether I'm rationalizing it or not, I'm not quite sure how to think about it, but as far as just the overall championship game, about 23 million people last year watched North Carolina Gonzaga, and uh, almost four million. I was pretty surprised uh, myself, not having been a huge women's basketball fan. You know, almost four million people watched South Carolina beat Mississippi State last year, which would be about 15%. So I'm not quite sure exactly what it is. We're still trying. No one, every time I ask someone, they just had said it over the summer they had no idea how big the market would be. So I've kind of been walking around thinking that, you know, maybe it's about 10%. It seems like that should be a conservative estimate for how much interest there is. Uh, what I think is pretty interesting, though, is I find the uh, overlap between sort of what I think of as the NBA Twitterverse, right, the Venn diagram of the NBA Twitterverse and women's college of basketball fans. It seems like there's almost no intersection. Um, I've had been fortunate uh, since I've been working in basketball for a while to know a lot of people, uh, a lot of influential people on the NBA side, and they've given me a lot of great support, um, you know, retweeting us on Twitter, spreading the word about herhoopstats.com, and uh, you know, surprisingly, to me at least, it hasn't driven uh, quite as much uptake uh, as I thought it might, and I've realized that's because uh, I've learned over time that the women's audience tends to skew a little bit older, so I don't think they're on Twitter as much. And one thing we'll talk about briefly is I think most fans, because they're not getting as much coverage in mass media, they're getting their coverage through the team's website. And so therefore, um, it's not quite as centralized as having someone like Kevin Pelton or Howard Beck or Zach Lowe kind of mention your site and suddenly the whole world knowing about it. So the, the audience is definitely smaller for the women's game, but we've established they're working hard. I think it's pretty clear and hopefully you didn't need me to make the case that the women deserve to have just as much information, especially the information that's pretty fundamental to the game uh, as the men. So of course the question is, you know, if you tried to Google uh, Markel Fultz and Kelsey Plum college stats last year, what would have come up? Uh, so not surprisingly, our friends at uh, Sports Reference, I never know whether to call them college basketball reference or basketball reference, uh, but they're the number one thing that comes up for Markel Fultz. You can also look at his game stats. Um, we do get his NBA stats, that's what comes up right now. He's got a Wikipedia page, and then, and I think this is important, there are other sites that have lots of information about Markel Fultz. Fox Sports, you know, Draft Express, not surprisingly, is coming up next in the, in the search list. For Kelsey Plum, you know, we do get uh, her actual college stats from uh, Yahoo, and, and so that's good that we can actually see how many points, assists, and whatnot. You know, interestingly, the second result, it's actually this season, so she's not playing, so there's a little bit of an issue there. She's got a Wikipedia page, and then we start to see her WNBA stats as well. So I think you can sort of see for Kelsey that already there's not as much information really available. But of course, the two of them are really outliers. There's over 3,000 people, 3,000 women that are playing women's basketball, and 3,000 men playing men's basketball. So I went in and took a look at 
their teammates, the sort of the eighth player in the rotation. For Washington, that was Sam Timmons last year. And hopefully you can see there's lots of different sites. Again, Sports Reference has information, ESPN has a page on him, Fox Sports, Real GM, he's got a Wikipedia page. Uh, the eighth player in the rotation for the Washington women, I believe you pronounce her first name Meloni Henson. And so actually, and again, I searched Meloni Henson college stats. The first things, two things that come up are really about her high school recruiting. She played for La Jolla Country Day. Actually, I believe she was uh, probably a teammate of uh, Kelsey Plum's in high school too. And we do get her stats coming from a site called Hero Sports. I'm not sure whether you guys have heard of that or not. Uh, interestingly, shout out to uh, Candace Buckner and Tim Bontemps. The Washington Post this really comes up often if you try to look up college stats uh, about women's players. So they, again, if you squint, you might be able to tell we've got our minutes per game, field goal percentage, and stuff like that. But already the fifth result when you Google Maloney Henson college stats is actually John Henson. So you can sort of see there's a problem. And then beyond that, you know, Sue Bird's over talking in one of the, probably in the Bill James room right now, uh, and we're still working on this with uh, herhoopstats.com. We haven't gone that far back, but to understand what Sue Bird's assist rate is right now is incredibly hard. You have to kind of go through, piece it out. I actually dug up Doris Burke's uh, assist rate when I saw she was uh, inducted, or won the Kirk Gowdy Award. I guess people are unclear on whether that's being inducted to the Hall of Fame. But you basically have to go through and find pieces of information from the Providence Media Guide to understand what's going on. Again, we have some of the basics, the typical things, but uh, you know, we only even have rebounds for her in this case. Uh, it's not split by offensive and defensive. So again, a lack of information. There's a real void. And so that leads to articles, you know, this one that Sue wrote about two years ago, just, I guess it must have been just after the Sloan Conference in 2016, analyzed this, sort of her call to arms for, you know, where is the analysis of uh, women's sports. Uh, this one's a little more focused on the WNBA, but uh, nevertheless, it was just speaking to the lack of coverage. And it also leads to articles like this. Shout out to uh, Ian Levy, who wrote this for 538. Um, it is really amazing, you just read it out loud. A website went offline and took most of college basketball analytics with it. You know, if sites like uh, Basketball Reference or, or, you know, or even ESPN went down, we would definitely be concerned, it'd be harder to get the information, but this whole, whole ecosystem of information about the men's game is much more resilient. And so it's pretty amazing. Uh, and something that you know we're hoping that in the next few years won't be as much of a challenge. Obviously, we're hoping to you know, be the gold standard for statistics about women's basketball, but uh, nevertheless, I hope we won't be the only one, as I'll mention again later. Uh, on a related note, I don't want to spend too much time about this, but on some of the main gambling sites, uh, you know, there's a lot of college basketball going on today and tomorrow, but on like Pinnacle or bookmaker.eu, you could not gamble on some of the Big Ten or Pac-12 games and whatnot that are going on. However, uh, in addition to curling, which isn't shocking, uh, given it's the Olympics, the figure skating, you can actually gamble on two divisions, I think, of uh, handball in France. Um, you can, I was a little surprised, I guess it's Europe, but you can gamble on snooker. I didn't expect CrossFit to be there. Entertainment, that's like I think the BAFTA awards at the time, and esports isn't shocking. But I did chuckle when I saw you could gamble on darts. Uh, so and maybe there's a lot of college basketball, a lot of basketball games available each day, so there's less of a need, unlike in the summer. But. Nevertheless, it's pretty, it was a little surprising to me. Perhaps it shouldn't have been. But it seems like you can gamble on anything, but you can't really gamble much on women's basketball. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on kind of what's available. Most of you probably recognize these just from the pictures. You know, there's great NBA resources, the NBA stats on NBA.com, which also includes advanced stats, synergy, and second spectrum. We've talked about basketball reference. I think this is important that there's lots of people both trying to do commercial work or sometimes just personal work if they're building their portfolio for the NBA. Uh, there's also great NCAA men's resources, right? Ken Palm is the gold standard. And again, you know, we're really following uh, Ken's model. Ken Pomeroy has been really supportive to us. And, you know, we think the idea of, you know, $20 a year makes it really accessible to everybody in the women's basketball community. You know, we really don't want it to be a premium product just for the power schools or something like that. And, but again, you've got basketball reference, Draft Express had information, still does a little bit. Um, and then this year, you're probably aware that the NCAA Men's Selection Committee, in addition to RPI, they've got a total of six metrics they're using. Um, so again, there's a diversity of people analyzing and making predictions about the women's game. I mean, the men's game. In contrast to that, you know, there's definitely challenges. This is the NCAA.org website, which I think is a primary source of information for people. Uh, you can see it looks a little dated. Let's just say there's definitely challenges. It's not very responsive, but I think a lot of people uh, go there for the information. And you can also see that um, it's pretty much all traditional stats. 
as a result, as I mentioned, people often go to the team sites to get their information. This is Tennessee's, which is actually in pretty good shape. It's relatively uh, visually appealing. You can see there's lots of different kinds of information, so that's good. But then other schools, and it's really very diverse in how it looks, um, you end up with pages that look like this. So, you know, this always, when I see this, that, you know, it makes me think of those green and white printers we used to have back when I was an undergrad at MIT. You know, you'd pull the perforated paper off as you were doing it. And amazingly, I don't know if you can see this, but this is UConn's page, right? So they're just amazing off the court in this at least one aspect, or amazing on the court in this one aspect off the court, uh, not quite uh, delivering the same performance they do on the court. And then the other challenge is if you now want to compare UConn to Tennessee players, very often you have to go to all these different sites. So for all of these reasons, um, we decided to start working on Her Hoop Stats over the summer. Uh, it started with a call from a friend of mine. I was the director of basketball analytics at the Philadelphia 76ers for a couple of years. Alex Varlin was an intern. Now he's the video coordinator for uh, the Tennessee Lady Vols. And he reached out to me and said, hey, like, what's available? And so I looked around, tried to find a site to recommend him. I vaguely remembered that Sue had written that article uh, and that Ian had written his article too. But uh, I was surprised there was still a need and for the 2017-18 season. I was surprised that the market was a little bigger than I thought um, based on kind of being oblivious to the world of women's basketball. So I decided to take the advice that a lot, I give to a lot of young people. It's kind of amazing. There's 4,000 people roughly uh, walking around this conference. But then if you think about the resources we all use, it's just a handful. There's, there's going to be more or more with the research papers and whatnot, but there are very few people that are actually taking the time to do the work and make valuable uh, sites that people are using on to as tools on a daily basis, even some of the smaller ones like in predictable.com. So I kind of walked into it thinking, uh, I just wrapped up a consulting project. I thought, you know, maybe this will be a business idea. You know, maybe it'll be a public service, but hopefully it'll be a fun project, something I enjoy, something I can learn uh, and whatnot. And so, you know, right now it's more of a public service, uh, but we're hoping over time as more and more people become aware of what we're doing uh, that more and more people will sign up. Because again, I think it's useful for coaching staffs, for SIDs, families of the players that would want to know that their niece, who's the backup point guard at Northeastern, you know, is actually, turns out, their ten per, top 10% in the country in assist rate. Right, right now, all you know is they have like two assists per game or something like that. So we think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of need. Uh, there have been a lot of challenges. I'm not going to spend too much time on this uh, slide. I would say certainly technical work, and there's a lot to do on that front. But for us, it's really about making the site kind of work well. In 2018, we've been really focused on trying to make it work well on your phone, which is how people are accessing their data now. Most basketball sites are really focused on accessing on your monitor, on your laptop. And then the challenge just around the community, uh, educating them why they might care about offensive rebounding rate as opposed to offensive rebounds per game. So for now, we just serve them both up. And then, as I said, letting them know. So we've been very fortunate to have a lot of early adopters. We're still working on getting the middle adopters, which you know we need to make sure that, that the early adopters are not also the late adopters. But uh, Tennessee, as you might expect, since my friend reached out to me, uh, has been using it. Stanford's been using it. Uh, pretty extensively. We actually have an analytics consultant that does some work for them. Uh, Louisville, um, Mich Mississippi State, South Carolina, all a lot of uh, teams that are using it. And WNBA, the Washington Mystics are using it as they're thinking about the draft. Cheryl Reeve has been a incredibly supportive. Katie Smith uh, just signed up the other day, so that was exciting. And then conferences too. It's a chance for conferences to uh, spread the word about how good their players are doing. We've also gotten amazing support from ESPN. Debbie Antonelli and Beth Moens have mentioned it on games in the past. Uh, Kara Lawson and Rebecca Lobo are the primary um, primarily com commentators for the uh, women's college basketball package on ESPN. And so I've been working with them to send them game notes. They've been really eager for the information. And then this last graphic, we were actually on at halftime. Probably can't see it so well. Um, when they were just discussing the preliminary seeds for the women's tournament and why Baylor, the NCAA had them ninth, and so they were eager to have uh, something like our Her Hoop Stats rating, which again is similar to the Ken Palm rating, uh, to say, oh no, actually they're probably like the third best team in the country. And so, you know, what are people getting for their $20 a year? You know, as I said before, First, we want to make sure we're giving them the stats they're used to, but we're adding context. We're either telling them their percentiles uh, or their ranks, depending on how you prefer it. Sometimes it's not that exciting to say that a player's you know, 232nd in shooting efficiency or true shooting percentage, but it's much more powerful to say that they're in the top 10% in the country. So we're letting people view it that way. And then what we are trying to do is serve up, again, the sort of traditional stats that 
people are aware of, and then if they're not as familiar with analytics, you know, we're putting offensive rebounding right there. Hopefully over time they'll get curious and learn why that's important. Uh, running a little low on time, so I think the main point of this slide is that in my experience, every women's basketball player, anyone in the women's basketball community, you know, all they really want to be treated, treated like as players, you know, as people that love basketball in the same way the men's people, men's team do. They don't need, uh, you know, play for K and whatnot aside. They're not eager for all the pink uh, equipment. They don't want to be treated in some different way. You know, it's everything that we've been talking about with the NBA or with the uh, men's college teams. Uh, and again, I think this communications piece is particularly valuable. So, I've made one, another thing we're doing that's pretty unique in the women's college basketball space, and we're just dipping our toes in it for now, is visualizing the data. So here, and again, if you're into basketball analytics, it's nothing revolutionary, but it's like, hey, why don't we plot offensive rating and defensive rating so you can see who excels in one space or another. Uh, here's a look at players, basically usage rate versus their shooting efficiency, true shooting percentage just converted to points per attempt, and so you can see that kind of efficient frontier now and just how amazing Aja Wilson uh, Megan Gustafson and Sophie, uh, Sophie Cunningham are. So Tierra McCowan also sort of jumps off the chart here as an incredible rebounder when you look at her offensive and defensive rebounding rate. I uh, just wanted to briefly talk for people that might be interested, I guess, afterwards about some of the technical considerations. You know, we knew there might be limited interest up front, so we wanted to make sure the site was sustainable and we didn't go away and have Ian writing an article about us next year. Uh, and we also knew that there might not be much financial compensation for doing this work, and so we wanted to make sure there were other benefits to us of doing it. So we wanted to make sure we were learning along the way instead of like taking a class on Coursera, doing something productive. And so I was able to recruit a couple friends, Neil Sees and uh, Savas Georgeglu, have been doing amazing work uh, for free on this, sort of with the hope that maybe it'll take off. And Grace Dickman's uh, just uh, finished her, she's a fifth year senior for McAllister in Division Three, and she's been kind of running our social media. And one technology we're pretty excited about is using this serverless uh, suite of tools. Um, we do it on Amazon, there are other options though if you're interested. And so I'll just close with this, you know, thinking about the future for women's uh, college basketball. I think there's a lot of a lot of opportunity there. It's very underserved. You know, we have so much more we want to do. I think we're probably our own harshest critics, hopefully, uh, about the site. We think it's, as I mentioned in an article this week in USA Today, it's probably version 0 0.1, not 1.0. But there's a lot more we can do with the existing data. Again, more charts. We're all box score based right now because there's challenges with the play-by-play -play data. There's opportunities there. And so there's a lot of work that's all very straightforward uh, if you are familiar with basketball analytics. But I think other interesting things to think about is you know, how can we help recruit more people to do more work in uh, women's college basketball. There's so many people eager for projects asking what should I work on. You know, instead of doing the 10,000th blog article about the NBA, you, know, you might be able to do the you know, 100th or 1,000th article uh, on basketball analytics for the women's game. And then I think it's gonna be fascinating to see what happens with the tracking data as more men's college teams purchase it. You can imagine at a school like Duke, if they, the men's team's purchasing, you know, from Second Spectrum Sport View, the, the visualization, all the equipment's there. So like, could the women get it for almost free without any of the costs? And sort of like cell phones for certain countries that started, um, you know, they just sort of jumped to cell phones. In five years, will the women's game jump from box score data all the way to uh, player tracking without play-by-play -play data. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity. I just wanted to say thanks. Also uh, encourage you to sign up, please, or tell your friends if you know anyone who'd be interested uh, in learning more about women's college basketball. I'm happy to take a question or two now, although we're running late, and talk as well afterward. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. My experience has been that if you talk to women, like they don't care about that, whereas like to me, that's an interesting question since I follow the NBA and women's college basketball. I do think there's differences. I did notice, for instance, offensive rebounding rates are a little bit higher in the women's game. I think there is more range of performance. I, you know, I thought about making plots about like three point percentage or free throw percentage for the women versus the men, but sort of chose not to do that. I think there's definitely some differences, but I also think the more I watch, like, you know, everybody loves watching Russell Westbrook drunk and things like that. Um, but 
you know, everybody in the NBA Twitterverse that goes crazy when the Spurs run an amazing hammer play, like they're doing that in women's college basketball, right? So it's sort of funny that like that doesn't uh, appeal to the same audience when it's fundamental. You know, like the more you're an NBA nerd, the more you're like, oh, I love this minutia and the stuff that isn't at the rim. And like, you know, that, you know, but then like somehow that's a complaint about the women's game is that it's not at the rim. Question? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of plans. We have a lot of dreams. Um, I'd be happy to tell you more about that. I know we're running low on time, but um, you know, really, what we need is to have more of the women's basketball community investing in us by subscribing, so that you know, effectively, if you think about it, if the fans are um, you know subscribing, and again, it's like twenty dollars a year, so we're trying to do it in a way that's like pretty easy for most, you know, families, fans, you know, young girls that are aspiring to be college basketball players, then at some level, it's, you know, collecting information, co collecting funding from the whole community to enable that kind of information. So, you know, I think the teams are going to be very interested in what's happening in Russia and other places. I was talking to someone about that earlier today. I mean, I don't think the American public is going to care that much unless they are the families even of Sue Bird. Uh, so, um, but, so we definitely think there's tons of opportunity. Also, D2 and D3 is something we thought about at a Canadian coach talking to me uh, yesterday outside up by the Bill James room. So um, I think there's plenty of, of room to do this and so much we want to do. And for us right now, it's really just about triage and getting ourselves established and stuff. But it's definitely the dream. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks a lot. I really